So if you look at this program, mm -hmm. so I am here, I introduce. Yeah. Then after that, it's product with the other. Yeah, yeah, but you're going to talk in the discussion. I am? Yeah, you're part of the Q&A. Okay. <laughs> okay. Can I go on now? Okay. <clears throat> Are they wired? Are they? No, not yet. They will like Okay. <laughs> Just, okay, uh good afternoon. I'm uh, Mwagi Kemenyi. I'm a senior fellow and director of the Africa Growth uh, uh, Initiative here at the Brookings Institution. And I'm uh, very happy to welcome you to uh, this event uh, that is focusing on the trilateral relations, uh, United States, uh, Africa, uh, and China. Uh, we have had a very uh, productive sessions since morning uh, with the several sessions that were sort of smaller sessions. Uh, and uh, I'm looking forward to uh, even deepening our understanding and, and, and opening it up to more people uh, in, the, in this discussion. And let me, uh, uh, before I introduce the panel, also note that uh, we have a guest who have come. We are doing a sort of a publication, and we've been having a year-long program where we've been doing a study on these issues, uh, but collaboratively uh, with African institutions, with Chinese institutions, and the Brookings Institution. So with this program, uh, we've been working with the Africa Growth Initiative here at Brookings, uh, the China Center uh, at, at Brookings, um, then uh, the uh, uh, institution in, uh, in China, uh, which is uh, called the Chinese Academy of uh, Social Sciences, and we have groups representing uh, CASA here, and also a think tank uh, from Africa, Ghana, uh, uh, called AISA. So we have many guests who are here who have not just uh, uh, the theory or talking about issues that uh, are, are distant from them, but people who are actually involved uh, with these institutions. Now, uh, China and Africa is actually a very increasingly important topic, sometimes emotional, uh, and sometimes people not, are not as well informed. And uh, I mentioned in previous discussion that I've just come back from Cape Town, uh, from the World Economic Forum on Africa, and uh, every discussion on growth in Africa would end up touching on, on China. Uh, it would, you know, you talk about infrastructure, you talk about China. You talk about natural resources, there's China involved, uh, and, and so on. And so I think this is an, a really appropriate time uh, for us to have a discussion on, uh, the, on these issues between U.S., uh, uh, Africa, and, and China. Uh, I would like to introduce the panel, and I'm actually not the one moderating. I'm going to start with uh, my colleague, uh, who will be moderating this panel. Uh, uh, Jonathan Pollack is a senior fellow and director of the Ch China Center here at the Brookings, and he's right uh, at the other end, uh, and uh, he will uh, moderate the panel. Uh, the other, uh, the f next guest is uh, Ibrahim Dasu. Uh, he is uh, the ambassador to the United States from the Republic of South Africa. It's a long bio, but I told him I will use one line uh, because uh, it will take a long time to introduce all, all of them. Uh, our guest on this side is Yang Guang, and he is the uh, director general of the Institute of Western Asian and African Studies at the Chinese Academy uh, of Social Sciences. Uh, welcome. And uh, then we have our own colleague here who we will be talking about U.S. perspective, um, Tony Carroll. He is uh, with uh, SAIS across here, but he is also uh, with Manchester Trade. So he's in the private sector doing business in Africa, so he has many perspectives. And uh, with that, we are looking forward to a good conversation. I was actually not aware that I was going to be in this debate, but I see a chair marked here with my name, so I guess I'll be here. So, uh, Jonathan? Uh, 
I think they're going to be wired. No, we're going to give comments in the podium. Yes, oh. uh, yeah, actually, each will speak from here, and then at the, when we're having a discussion, it can okay. be, it can be uh, we will be individually wired. So I don't want to add further. I mean, I would rather take advantage of the limited time we have to proceed immediately to our three speakers. Uh, I would only say this. I think that what we saw this morning uh, was a sense of the interconnectedness of the issues that we are grappling with here. On the one hand, looking at the dynamics, particularly in sub-Saharan Africa, obviously, but then how China and the United States separately factor into that overall equation. And not looking so much at the immediate here and now, but really beginning to think longer term about the implications of developments that are evident uh, in all these interrelationships. So I am very, very confident we'll have a very, very productive uh, discussion. Uh, the, the presentations, as was just noted, will be kept relatively brief so that we will then have a brief session amongst the panelists, and then we will open it up for questions and answers. So, Mr. Ambassador. Thanks very much, um, Jonathan, for not situating us in the debate very well. So I'm trying to use the brief time to grapple on a few things. But maybe I think that what I should do is to start with how President Zuma um, addressed the Fifth Forum on China-Africa Cooperation or FOCAC on the 19th of July 2012 because I think it comes right to the heart of the dialectical relationship almost that South Africa and by implication Africa has with China. President Zuma in that address speaks amongst others to President Yu Jintao at the time and lists all the contribution that China has made to the African continent. And he says, and I quote him, China's commitment to Africa has already been demonstrated through tangible and concrete results, particularly in terms of human resource development, debt relief, and investment. President Zuma then continues, on the other hand, Africa's commitment to China's development has been demonstrated by the supply of raw materials, other products, and technology transfers. President Zuma concludes the argument and says, as we all agree, Your Excellency, this trade pattern is unsustainable in the long term. And I think that if anyone thinks that Africa is simply seduced into a relationship that is one way and starry-eyed, I think that President Zuma's opening remarks begins to situate that situation very well and what the debate is between China and Africa. President Zuma continues to begin to identify where we'd like the relationship to go to. And he says, and I quote him again, it is necessary that we lock in investments in addressing supply-side constraints diversification and beneficiation of the resources derived from African countries through encouraging joint ventures between Africa and China. And he proceeds on that point to begin to identify which sectors we think those joint ventures, beneficiation, diversification and others could come and address us amongst others infrastructure, energy, science and technology, green economy, and agriculture and agribusiness, etc., etc. I thought that it was important um, to, 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 to really take the heart out of President Zuma's speech at FOCAC and to put it centrally and primarily on the table here because that is the parameters of the debate between China and Africa while there is enormous cooperation and I think almost in the absence of serious U.S. engagement with Africa other than the historical ones like the African Growth and Opportunities Act 
and some of the new and recent ways in which the U.S. has come. But the U.S. has had the situation where it has, particularly after the recession of 2008, effectively withdrawn from the African continent. So I like to quote um, Cosby, Stills, and Nash, who sang, if you can't be with the one you love, you love the one you're with. Um, FOCAC itself, the Forum on China-Africa Cooperation, was an attempt by Africans not simply to engage China as country to country, but as continent and China, in order that we, in a sense, coordinate our relationship with China, necessarily so because we yearn for a regionally integrated economy, we yearn for cross-border decisions on infrastructure, we yearn for intra-African trade, and therefore we may exacerbate all of those negative problems if we were simply to engage China as South Africa, China, Mozambique, China, Zimbabwe, China, etc. We may end up with lots of rail, but nothing integrated. And so I think that FOCAC plays that particular role um, within us. In response almost to this imperative, um, amongst others articulated by President Zuma, FOCAC's focus for the next year is build on next few years till 2015 is build on past achievements and open new prospects for the new type of China-Africa strategic partnerships. And so in a sense, there is an acknowledgement that we need to not only continue but renew the type of relationship between um, the two. And as a result, I think the commitments that China has been making begins to attempt some of that diversification, industrialization, and beneficiation that we are um, speaking about. I think we followed that on when South Africa hosted in March this year the fifth BRIC summit. And the summit itself focused on development, integration, and industrialization. It's a broader audience with Russia, India, Brazil as well, but China is also central to that BRICS, and so those things go on the agenda, and in the leadership retreat, the issue of infrastructure is fairly central. It was an attempt by Africans not simply to engage China as country to country, but as continent and China, in order that we, in a sense, coordinate our relationship with China, necessarily so because we yearn for a regionally integrated economy, we yearn for cross-border decisions on infrastructure, we yearn for intra-African trade, and therefore we may exacerbate all of those negative problems if we were simply to engage China as South Africa, China, Mozambique, China, Zimbabwe, China, etc., we may end up with lots of rail, but nothing integrated. And so I think that FOCAC plays that particular role um, within us. In response almost to this imperative, um, amongst others articulated by President Zuma, FOCAC's focus for the next year is build on next few years till 2015 is build on past achievements and open new prospects for the new type of China-Africa strategic partnerships. And so in a sense, there is an acknowledgement that we need to not only continue but renew the type of relationship between um, the two. And as a result, I think the commitments that China has been making begins to attempt some of that diversification, industrialization, and beneficiation that we are um, speaking about. I think we followed that on when South Africa hosted in March this year the fifth BRIC summit. And 
the summit itself focused on development, integration, and industrialization. It's a broader audience with Russia, India, Brazil as well, but China is also central to that BRICS, and so those things go on the agenda, and in the leadership retreat, the issue of infrastructure is fairly central. But South Africa used the opportunity not simply as the one African BRICS country it invited and received positive RSVPs from 15 African heads of state who attended. The NEPAD leaders, the African Union leadership, the regional economic communities, all in this discussion on how BRICS will make this impact on, on Africa. And I think, again, it's a way of conducting coordinated discussions with China with very sharp objectives that go beyond simply raw materials and often infrastructure buildings. We all know some of the outcomes. The BRICS Bank starting off with 100 billion US dollars, looking at infrastructure, contingency reserve funds, etc. The BRICS Business Council linking up private sectors um, across Africa and the other BRICS members and the BRICS think tanks to begin to generate policy options. I want to conclude by just thinking aloud about how the United States, hopefully as it emerges increasingly from a recession, and how China can both begin to find, not, if not synergy, then enough space on the African continent. Um, and so, for example, I look at the South Africa-China trade figures, and China has become our number one export market, for example, as South Africa. But 80% of our exports to China are raw materials. The U.S. is now number three as South Africa's export markets, but 70% of our goods to the U.S. is manufactured. Now, that, I think is not only a description of what exists, but the reason that the U.S. should either cooperate with China on the continent or contest China on the continent. Hopefully it is cooperate and contest. So I think that that's a very important statistic that begins to define the relationship and why we need the U.S. to be able to come in a lot more. I think the U.S. must use its own bilateral engagements with China to begin to understand how to utilize this moment of democratic growth, political depth, and human rights cultures and the rule of law in and its emerging economy and how Africa can be a benefit to the world and how the world can keep an upward momentum on Africa's growth tra trajectory. But I also suspect that Stephen Hayes is correct when he says that the U.S. in order to come into um, Africa must also address its competitive disadvantages that U.S. firms encounter in relation to Chinese firms. And it may require the U.S. government to become a lot more active, whether it is how they allow tax repatriations and um, offsets and all of those kind of things, um, its agency coordinations, in order, I think, to be able to, to do it, and simply how it does its economic diplomacy. In Africa, the U.S. is reducing its foreign commercial offices. China almost has a foreign commercial officer in every country. And I think that the table is not being laid for the kind of cooperative and competitive relationships between China on the one hand and the U.S. on the other hand on the African continent. I think for Africa's sake, we need both, based on what President Zuma said and based on the trade figures that I've spoken about. I think our moment is there, and the rising tide in Africa can raise both U.S. and Chinese ships. Thank you very much.
Good afternoon, uh, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, uh, this, this morning and uh, beginning of this afternoon, we have had a very uh, fruitful uh, trilateral dialogue. Though it's called trilateral dialogue, but actually most of discussions focus on China and Africa. <laughs> so uh, I think it's probably useful for me uh, here to uh, first uh, give some, you know, uh, background about China-African relations. Uh, actually, China-African relations is not something new. Uh, I don't know whether you know uh, these relations can trade back to 1,300 years ago. In 8th century, China and Africa had the first, very first direct contact. Uh, but since the uh, late 1970s, when China began the reform and opening up policy, China-African relations reached a new peak and uh, got a very rapid development. Uh, and the relations, China-African relations is generally, in China, is just generally defined as a kind of a strategic partnership. In other words, the relations are based on some long-term and core interests of both sides. At the political level, China and Africa support, have been supporting each other uh, for many years, concerning some respective core interests and uh, sovereignty issues. And for instance, China, for instance, have been actively participated, involved in, the, uh, in ensuring uh, peace and the security of Africa. And the two examples I can, I can give here is one, China uh, has participated actively in the UN peacekeeping program in Africa and has sent the largest number of soldiers uh, for peacekeeping among the five member countries of UN Security Council. Another well-known example is China's participation in the anti-pirate uh, efforts in the Indian Ocean. And at the economic level, uh, the cooperation is becoming more and more intensive. And I have to say that economic cooperation is indeed a very new dimension of China-African relations. Why China-African economic development have developed, uh, relations have developed so fast. I think it's based on the complementarity of the two economies. Africa is a very important source of uh, raw material supply for China, as it is for many other countries. Nowadays, Africa is the supplier number two of China's energy import, oil import, to be more specific, oil import. And uh, in addition of energy, China also import other raw materials like timbers, uh, iron, uh, manganese, coppers, and many others. And this import plays a very important role in ensuring a high growth rate of Chinese economy. Uh, China provides, in return, in exchange for this import of raw materials, China is a big provider of manufacturing goods to Africa. Uh, and it, he, it is also a major provider of service to Africa. 
by service, here I mean uh, basically the construction service. So you may see uh, you know, a lot of Chinese construction workers now, nowadays are working in Africa, building infrastructure, stadiums, you know, schools, hospitals, so far and so on. So this is the basic uh, pattern of uh, trade between China and Africa, which is based on the uh, mutual complementarity of the two economies. And I have to say that this trade has also uh, significantly contri contributed to African development as well. Because according to statistics released by MOFCON, Chinese Ministry of Commerce, until 2008, China-African trade contributed to 25% of African GDP growth. So this, growth, this contribution is, was quite visible. Apart from trade, China is becoming also uh, a source of foreign direct investment for African economy. Nowadays, around 2,000 Chinese uh, companies are operating in African market. Here I mean the direct investors. With most of them, around 80% of them, are private business firms. And these companies, by investing in Africa, have created jobs, according to some statistics, Chinese companies has created 80,000 jobs in Africa, <clears throat> generated tax, taxes, uh, enhanced export, and promoted industrialization of African countries. And finally, I have also to mention the Chinese assistance to Africa, which has been significantly diversified. Nowadays, China not only provides some project-related assistance to African countries, but also provides assistance in the form of foreign debt exemption, exemption of the import duty, and uh, uh, human resources development uh, assistance, and in many other forms of uh, assistance. And uh, this is the, the amount of uh, Chinese assistance to Africa, though it's uh, uh, still quite difficult uh, to be available, uh, but uh, I'm so happy to have learned that two American think tanks have just released uh, studies, their studies, and according to their studies, from the year 2000 to the year 2011, China has provided, China provided uh, assistance to Africa, uh, which was totaled 75 billion U.S. dollars. And for the same period of time, the United States provided 90 billion U.S. dollars. And uh, finally, China has, in recent years, uh, the Chinese government uh, has also uh, uh, put emphasis on promoting cultural exchange with the African countries, because with more Chinese, more uh, with the economic and political relations enhanced, uh, the Ch Chinese government and uh, uh, Chinese people realize that without promoting cultural, mutual understanding at the cultural level, the economic ties and the political ties could not be properly maintained. 
So bearing that idea in mind, in recent years, you know, China has uh, uh, developed the so-called Confucius Institute program in Africa. Nowadays, there are already 29 Confucius Institutes in a number of African countries. Uh, and in the framework of FOCAC, China-Africa uh, Cooperation Forum, which was mentioned by Ambassador just now, six forum of dialogue have been created, which include, for example, the dialogue of NGOs, the dialogue of think tanks, the dialogue of educational institutions, and so forth and so on. And with this dialogues, with this uh, forums, the people-to-people -people, uh, dialogue is uh, implemented. And I would like here to, to finish also by mentioning the FOCAC. The FOCAC was established in the year 2000, which is the coordinating uh, mechanism for China-African relations. It's held every three years, and uh, each time the forum reviews the previous, the, the achievement and problems of cooperation with Africa over the past three years, and makes a plan for the coming three years. So a lot of Chinese policies towards Africa are, formula are formulated in the framework of FOCAC. And the, the very topic, subject of this dialogue is China-American-African trilateral cooperation. In other words, we're trying to discuss the issue how China, United States, and African countries cooperate in favor of African development. A lot of ideas have been, uh, have been uh, raised uh, during uh, the discussion. And we realize that in the continent of Africa, China and the United States don't have major conflicting interests. On the contrary, this is the area where we can cooperate. And uh, areas like education, infrastructure, and many others have been mentioned as possible areas for future trilateral uh, cooperation. But this discussion is only the very beginning. I hope you know, this discussion will continue, and in the coming discussion, uh, discussions we will find you know, more concrete uh, measures and policy proposals to make China, United States, and African trilateral cooperation a reality. Thank you very much. Well, using references to song, my old songbook, uh, love the one you're with, uh, I guess as an outside observer, we'll remember the song by Bob Dylan all along the watchtower. I'm here to observe on the comments of the first two speakers and perhaps offer my observations over a 35-year career of doing business in Africa. First started as a Peace Corps volunteer in Botswana in 1976. Um, fortunately, I have the opportunity to have participated in this morning's discussion and uh, was recruited at the last minute to substitute for my good friend Don Tattlebaum 
who was called away on other State Department business. So I'm not in any way trying to represent the U.S. government here, and I hope that none of you will go away uh, inferring that my position is a position that's reflected either in the White House or Foggy Bottom, as it turns out, probably far from the case. Um, however, I would like to offer some observations. Uh, firstly, I think, uh, echoing the Director's last comments, I, I think there's a, a, a relevant space for both America and China in Africa. And, and I have a lot of uh, good things to say about that space. Uh, in the uh, outset of the Olympics uh, in South Africa, which were so wonderfully hosted by South Africa, uh, the, the opening phrase was, Kenako, it's time. Well, it's time for Africa, and it has been time for Africa for the last several years. Africa is growing. Of course, we have to dis distinguish between some of the more achieving and less achieving countries, but uh, across the board, Africa is growing. Certain economies are, are just absolutely surging ahead. And I think part of that is a product of investments by both the United States and in China in both complementary and sometimes competition ways. First of all, the U.S. has bought over the years a, a persistent, consistent pattern of development assistance. Some of it is, is certainly driven to support our commercial interests, has been written, but a lot of it has been really for uh, developing institutions of governance. It's been directed at, at assisting in, in health. PEPFAR has been a, a remarkable success across Africa in, in bettering and keeping the lives, uh, lives millions of people alive. Looking at new models of development in the Millennium Challenge Corporation, we've really pushed the envelope in, in our development assistant, assistance by being smarter and more nimble and trying to help provide Africa, I think, with the, with the support that it needs to integrate, to grow economically. So we've really played a strong role. We've brought technology. We've most... Most Africans with graduate degrees hold them from uh, outside of, at least outside of Africa, from U.S. institutions. We've had a long-standing economic and ec uh, education cooperation with Africa. So I think we've had a very strong role. But I think the accelerant, the multiplier effect that's been brought by China with its enormous amount of investment has also played a very important role. Uh, the Chinese investment and, and, and loan assistance has gone into areas that the U.S. has vacated for 15 and 20 years, large infrastructure projects, long-term uh, vision that they bring to projects, I think has also helped Africa grow. Uh, Africa's, uh, China's borrowing from its wonderful development experience of bringing hundreds of millions of people out of poverty in the last 15 years. And I think that's not a point that's lost upon the Africans. Uh, they also bring, it, bring with them a, a development experience which is more relevant to many of the African uh, economies. They've, they've dealt with smallholder agriculture. They've dealt with small industrialization. They've, they understand many of the challenges that Africa co contends. So I think there's a relevance there that echoes among the uh, Africans. I think also that the Chinese, to their credit, have invested a lot of their diplomatic resources in trying to improve their relations with with the United States. We look at the proliferation of, of Chinese economic outreach to Africa, and it's quite astounding that even countries like Burundi have economic and trade counselors operating in their countries, learning their local languages, getting to know the culture. And of course, it's a work in progress. 15 or 20 years ago, it wasn't probably as effective, but now you're, you're finding Swahili-speaking uh, Chinese uh, diplomats in East Africa. Our good friend David Shin has written extensively about this for many, many years, and he was here this morning, again, reminding us of his great wisdom and observation over the years. So the Chinese are being more nimble, they're being more thoughtful, they're being more progressive. But, you know, I think there are areas that we can all work together. I don't think it's an us versus them. When I first started working in Africa, uh, it was more about our fears and competitions with Europeans, whether it be, whether it be French or whether it be Italian and FCPA and all these other problems that haunted us back then. Uh, but I honestly think that there are many areas where the Chinese and the Americans can play a continuing useful role. I think one of the areas that has always concerned me is uh, the deindustrialization de of Africa. I think in, of the course of the joining the WTO and opening of markets, what has unfortunately happened is a deindustrialization of Africa. Some of that has been China's entry onto the scene, offering low-cost consumer products and, and manufacturers, which the African consumers want. But unfortunately, it's been the, at the expense of the African textile industry, some agro-processing, many consumer goods. And I don't think it's in China's best interest, nor Africa's best interest, nor our best interest to see Africa become deindustrialized. So I do think that there are opportunities now that Africa is offering labor surplus, which we all know exists in abundance, for the Chinese to perhaps be a little bit more creative and, and a little bit more conscious about trying to reinvest 
in Africa's industrial capacity so that we can create wealth and jobs and, 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 and foster uh, technology transfer. Uh, on the other hand, I think there are areas where we can cooperate with the Chinese in advancing Africa's interests in the global uh, uh, trade agenda. I think the Doha round has long been dormant. I think we have to take a real hard look at where uh, we can make improvements in, in really making this a development round and be meaningful for Africa. I think the uh, Chinese have been very successful in wooing the support of the Africans in such plurilateral or multilateral fora as the WTO. But I think s securing that support has not been followed with leadership of those interests. And I think the Chinese could do a lot more in bargaining for the Africans in these, uh, in these fora to try to maintain uh, a great, greater market access in the BRIC countries, to foster more technical assistance. I think there are many things that the Chinese can do in the lead in helping Africa have a greater place in the uh, global agenda. Uh, and, and, in, and in closing, uh, just let me say that in, in the spirit of, of, of this event today, uh, I don't fear, I f welcome many of the corporate interests. As uh, Director Guang said, we've seen in the just in the last six or seven years, a real shift away from sort of uh, government bilateral assistance to private assistance, about 79 or 80 percent uh, from the, across the street from the Institute of Global Development, not the Institute of Global, the Global Center for Global Development has come up with some studies. So there's been a real sea change in the last six years of moving toward the private sector. I think there are ways in which um, we heard uh, from our fellow colleagues from Africa this morning about some of the uh, more... Um, uh, con uh, conflicted areas of business practices. I think that uh, the Chinese private sector that's going into Africa now needs to also play a larger leadership role, needs to assume more responsibilities in, in trying to set standards for its groups and its fellow companies to try to adhere to good practices. I'm talking about the natural resource sector especially. So uh, my observations are, are only those today. I'd be happy to answer questions, but I I don't want to be seen as or, uh, representing any U.S. government interests just as an observer of, of things between Africa and, and China over the last many years. So thank you. As our panelists uh, get mic'd up, uh, given the tightness of time, uh, I'm going to forego any comments that I might have made other than to observe that all three of the panelists here, I think, have imparted a sense that there is this extraordinary mosaic that is developing in Africa today. And what is most important, it seems to me, is not to dwell on necessarily the competitive or conflictful interests between uh, the United States and China, but to recognize that Long-term Africa can't be an object. It has to have a dynamic of its own. Uh, it has interests of its own, and that has to be the basis on which uh, uh, I think an intelligent long-term policy uh, has to proceed. Um, the only other observation I'd make, and then I'm going to open the floor to, to, to comments, is that so much of what we heard about today replicates the dynamics that we are seeing in a number of regions uh, of the globe today, and that there are, to, to be sure, inherent tensions or uncertainties, because I think from the perspective of the United States and China, each country may see a certain comparative advantage that it possesses in terms of longer-term transitions. But if there's one thing that I take away from the comments here is that although development is central to, this, to these relationships, um, economics alone, economic interest alone, cannot carry uh, these relationships long-term. They have to be embedded on a deeper political a concept, it seems to me, of how Africa emerges long term. Uh, with that as introductory comments, everyone else is mic'd up. That's fine. Uh, I will simply uh, welcome your questions for the time that we have available. Given that the time is very, very limited, I would ask you to be very brief in your questions. Please identify yourself if you want to direct a question to a specific panelist, by all means do so. The first hand I saw is right there. That gentleman. Yes, and you get the mic first. Yeah, my, I'm sorry. Yeah, my name is Joseph Asike, Howard University. Uh, my question is directed to the director, the Chinese, uh, you know, speaker. 
Can you address briefly you know, your contributions towards uh, human rights in your relationship with Africa? And what attempts are you making to develop you know, human resources, not just extracting minerals or investing you know, to extract uh, profits? What are your efforts to develop uh, human, you know, human resources, human development? Because the West had been engaged in this for over a century. Okay. Yeah, oh, yeah. Why don't I take several questions at the outset? Uh, yes, another hand is up right there. Yes, I would like to intervene. Uh, please, can you identify yourself? I would like to intervene to try to... Could you identify yourself, please? To improve. My name is Luis Sangare. I work with African Union for four years, and uh, I, I uh, prepared the meeting on uh, strategic partnership between India, China, and Brazil. And we have a meeting on it, and uh, I think this was followed by the group, etc. But I would like to try to improve this, the scheme uh, proposed by uh, my friend from China. And uh, I would like to connect this with the observation made by the gentleman over there about African de-industrialization. De de I believe the scheme has to be improved. You have to be improved based. Excuse me, can you pose a question rather than a commentary? We don't have time for long comments. Can you yeah, pose a question? Thank but you. My, it's, not, it's not a question. I am proposing to improve the scheme, and at the same time, it is a question. And so I, uh, will, I am saying this. The change, the exchange between raw material and manufacturer good is not proper. What I would like to suggest, given the availability of cheap natural resources in Africa, we have close to 200,000 megawatt of electricity not counting gas in the north of Nigeria, three billion uh, metric ton of gas in Nigeria. Uh, Africa have a lot of natural uh, energy. We have INO, high quality. Sir, I'm going to have to ask you in the interest of everyone. Going to sure. up to 80%. Uh, and so what I'm proposing is, is it possible to produce semi-products in Africa, be it in the field of steel, or methanol, ethylene, propane, in the field of petrochemistry, and or, or flat feed in the field of aluminum, and export those semi-products not only in uh, China, a cheaper price, better quality also, but also to America, cheaper price, since you are still exporting, still in America, but maybe at higher price. And so this will improve a lot the efficiency of the three economy. Yes. Thank, thank you. Thank, thank you. you. Uh, I saw a hand up right here. Yes, this gentleman right here. My name is David Alfer with Safer World. I wonder if you could speak to, I think, extending a bit on a question that was asked, how dynamics of conflict and state fragility are being entered into the discussions of development policy and interests in various parts of Africa, and especially whether perceptions of U.S.-China conflicting interests are affecting that kind of dynamic. Um, why don't we qu quickly ask the panelists, anyone who wants to make comments on any of these questions, and then, as time allows, we'll try to get another round of questions. I'm sorry that this is going to have to be very, very brief. 
So uh, shall we begin, well, in the same order of speaking, if there are any comments that any of our panelists wish to make? Yeah, th thank you very much. I think on the second um, comment, um, I think rather than bemoan simply the fact that there's an imbalance between what we send to China and what we receive from China in terms of raw materials and um, manufactured goods, we may have to utilize this as a transitional moment, as occasioning a transition in which Africans use the proceeds, the liquidity, the windfall mm -hmm. that comes from what we earn at this moment through raw materials and invest it in the industrialization capacity, the ability to acquire the technologies, the skills, and so forth, in order to let the next generation of exports, whether to China or anywhere else in the world, reflect the kind of um, situation that you're speaking about. South Africa, for example, would look at becoming a hub in southern Africa for um, the adding value to natural gas and petroleum because we have a long-standing company and technology like Cecil mm -hmm. um, who can do the refinery issues and derive all the, the industrial byproducts um, of, of natural gas, for example. I think that that's really the kind of, of way, and I suspect mm -hmm. that the debates at FOCAC and BRICS and so forth are becoming a lot sharper and a lot more focused, and we're finding, I think, though, that it would be helped by increased competition um, from countries like the United States, which gives Africa an option, a menu, about where to send what kind of goods. Do we only have the option to export raw materials, or do we have the option to export both raw materials and manufactured goods? So I would, I would see this as occasioning that transitional moment. Very good. Uh, Directly, Young, uh, uh, do you want to make a... Uh, sure. Uh, I think there are three questions coming to me. The first about uh, human uh, resource development, yes. Uh, you know, under uh, FOCAC, uh, the, the Forum of China-African Cooperation, there is a program for uh, human resource development. And according to that program, every three years, China, uh, the Chinese side will train uh, 30,000 African uh, professionals, should it be engineers, uh, professors, or technicians. So uh, every three years, uh, 30,000. Uh, in addition, uh, each year, China also provides a scholarship for a number of African students. So uh, in, in this regard, China uh, does something. And the second question is, is, I think it's a very good question, is about whether it's possible for China to extend the value chain uh, of African resources, not only just to import, but to transform it into more valuable products locally. And this is exactly what China is doing. A typical example is the refinery built in Sudan. Uh, yeah, with that, the, China, the Chinese oil company you know, began with uh, exploiting oil resources of Sudan. But later on, with the uh, Sudanese part, a joint venture refinery was, was built. And with that refinery, uh, this country, Sudan, you, you know, which used to, to depend on import of oil products, has achieved self-sufficiency of oil products. I don't know, probably one day they're going to become a net exporter of oil products. And the third one is about uh, whether uh, conflict uh, resolution has been uh, approached during the, the dialogue. Yes, uh, because the, I think this kind of cooperation already exists. Mm -hmm. It exists in the framework of UN Security Council. Everything China is doing to ensure peace, uh, peace and stability of Africa uh, is carried out in the framework of UN uh, 
peacekeeping program or according to uh, UN resolutions, which are made by the five permanent members, including the United States. Uh, I'll only address the issue of uh, the infrastructure beneficiation of Africa's natural resources. And I try to draw the comparison with what Brazil looked like 25 or 30 years ago. Uh, I think many of the same arguments and, and uh, uh, development patterns are occurring in Africa. And of course, we have to distinguish among the African countries to really have an intelligent and detailed discussion on this. But I think as Africa invests in its infrastructure, as Africans uh, become urbanized, as they become more skilled, as they have this youth bulge advantage, as transportation linkages become better, I think Africa will find more opportunities to transform the iron ore of Simandu using uh, natural available west, uh, uh, natural gas in West Tower to, to fuel furnaces, to put them on ships that are more frequently sailing to destination markets and being able to be managed by Africans uh, with the skills that are necessary. So I do think that's a process. If you look at what's happened in, in Brazil, as anything of a model, I think that can happen in Africa. Um, yeah, I'm, I'm going to allow um, Mwange to make a couple of very uh, quick uh, Yeah, comments. maybe very quickly. I think that uh, as Africans, we have to be careful not to shift the blame to uh, every time we have an issue to say that's the problem of the other partner. I think for Africa-China relations, I think Africans need to manage the relationship uh, better. Uh, so we shouldn't be uh, always being critical of China because, for example, I mean, most U.S. exports, uh, I mean, African exports to the U.S. are basically 90% is still natural resources, is oil. Mm -hmm. So it's the same thing. Uh, the question is, as uh, Tony said, is how do we actually manage uh, in terms of uh, the manage those natural resources? And Africa receives a lot of revenue, a lot of wind for that, could invest for uh, economic transformation. So I think the, the issue is much more on what do our leaders and our, our, our people in Africa do to manage those natural resources to transform their own uh, economies. Um, thank you. I really regret I'm, we're going to have to cut off the discussion at this point. We have a concluding panel. I would encourage any of you who didn't have time uh, to have your hands recognized that perhaps the opportunities will now arise with the concluding panel, and I don't want to deny them their opportunity as well. So if we could all uh, thank our panelists for our most welcome contribution. Dr. Guan, thank you, sir. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. It's, it's, it's. yeah. yeah. We, are, we actually don't have a break in between, so we are, we are continuing. There's another panel uh, discussing.